great day. It's quickly approaching, and we are in need of volunteers. And so um, there's a lot of different committees and groups that you can help serve on. And so if you would be interested in helping us plan a fantastic rally dinner, please contact the church office. Ann Otten will be leading a Bible study on Wednesday nights, Take My Hand Again. This is a faith-based guide for caregivers and will be used as a focal point for a support group. And so that would be a great um, Bible study to be involved with. We have a new members class will be held for anyone wishing to join First St. Paul's Church. And so if you are a visitor here today and have been visiting for a while, we would love for you to come and check out the new members class and just learn about what it means to be a member here. And I realize if you're a visitor here today or, or this is your first time, my name is Pastor Andrea and I have been here for about two months. I'm from North Dakota, which explains why I care about the bison. <laughs> but it is great to have you here to worshiping with us today. Oh, I forgot one. Sorry about that. The LCW is sponsoring a mission project, Hearts and Hands for Hunger, which is formerly known as Kids Against Hunger. This will take place on Saturday, October 8th at 9 a.m. in the Old Middle School on 7th Street. This is open to the congregation. This would be an excellent way for us as a congregation to serve but we need a head count so that they can get the right amount of supplies for that project. A sign-up sheet is on the guest desk in the gathering area, and so please do consider taking part on Saturday, October 9th at um, 9 a.m. With that, I've got too much paper in my hand. The peace of Christ be with you always. I invite you to rise this morning, move around, and greet those. We're here to worship today.
Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the Church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. For this holy house, and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. Glory to God in the highest, and peace to God's people on earth. Bibles. The Holy Gospel according to Luke, 
the 16th chapter. Glory to you, o Lord. Then Jesus said to the disciples, There was a rich man who had a manager, <coughs> and charges were brought to him that this man was squandering his property. So he summoned him and said to him, What is this that I hear about you? Give me an accounting of your management, because you cannot be my manager any longer. Then a manager said to himself, What will I do now that my master is taking this position away from me? I am not strong enough to dig, and I am ashamed to beg. I have decided what to do so that, when I am dismissed as manager, people will welcome me into their homes. So, summoning his master's debtors one by one, he asked the first, how much do you owe my master? He answered, a hundred jugs of olive oil. The manager said to him, take your bill, sit down quickly, and make it fifty. Then he asked another, how much do you owe? He replied, a hundred containers of wheat. The manager said to him, take your bill, and make it eighty. And his master commended the dishonest manager because he had acted shrewdly. For the children of this age are more shrewd in dealing with their own generation than are the children of light. And I tell you, make friends for yourselves by means of dishonest wealth, so that when it is gone, you may wel they may welcome you into their eternal homes. Whoever is faithful in very little is faithful also in much. And whoever is dishonest in a very little is dishonest also in much. If then you have not been faithful with the dishonest wealth, who will entrust to you the true riches? And if you have not been faithful with that which belongs to another, who will give you what is your own? No slave can serve two masters, for a slave will either hate the one and love the other, or be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and wealth. This is the gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. Our gospel response hymn today is number 587. There is a wideness in God's mercy.
invite you to be seated. Well, I have to be honest, as I was, uh, well, I'll start with this. I should always be honest. I'm always honest. But I was once accused, fairly, <laughs> of finding God in everything. If I watch a movie or a TV show, and any kind of music, you can be sure that I will find a way that God has made his presence into that piece of art or culture. And as I thought about this passage, this one random song kept coming to mind. <laughs> Let's go to Luke and Bach, Texas. <laughs> I mean, like, oh. <laughs> The successful life we're living got us feuding like the Hatfields and McCoys. That part's not going to apply today, I promise. Between Hank Williams' pain songs and Newberry's train songs and blue eyes crying in the rain, out in Luke and Buck, Texas, there ain't nobody feeling no pain. Well, if you know this song, you are likely going, seriously, what? If you are young enough that you don't have a clue who that is, you need all to get schooled in classic country. <laughs> Seriously, I'm sorry. And I know it seems like it's a stretch, and I realize that this, this takes this song way out of context. But again, I find God in everything. And so it's not the chorus that catches my attention, it's this. We've been so busy keeping up with the Joneses, four car garages, and we're still adding on. Baby, it's time to get back to the basics of love. Would you pray with me? Lord God, we thank you for the words of scripture that convict us and speak to our hearts. I pray this morning that the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart would be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, my God, my rock, and my redeemer. Amen. Now, first of all, if, you were, if you've read this passage enough over the years, or, or this morning, or whatever, this is a complex passage. And as I was preparing for this and studying and reading, I was also conversing with some of my friends from seminary who are now pastors and other pastors I know who are also preaching this passage today. And a dear friend of mine from Minnesota, a pastor there, shared this article, Thoughts from the Weirdest Parable Jesus Ever Told. <laughs> And there is so much truth to that statement. We have a rich man, a master, who's found out that his manager has been less than honest. He's been squandering the rich man's property. And now Luke does not tell us how he has squandered it or why he has been reckless with the master's property. We just know that in some way the manager has been irresponsible. The manager has mismanaged things that were not his. The manager knows he's in trouble and threatened with dismissal. And you have to understand that if he was dismissed as a, as a manager, this would have led to a severe shift in his social status. And that's why we read, I will not dig, I cannot beg, because to do either of those things would have put them in that category of unclean unwanted and expendable. And so this manager takes a course of action that will reduce the financial burden of the debtors so that they will bring them into his homes after he's out of a job. And so we read through verses 5 through 7 and it just smacks of dishonesty and really bad ethics. And yet the rich man, the master, commends his manager for the shrewd behavior. So Jesus uses this, the weirdest parable he ever told, to instill in his disciples then, and also for us to think about today, what it means to be shrewd with our resources. First of all, it's clear, it's important that we point out right off that this is what Jesus is not saying. It is imperative to make note that Jesus is not praising the dishonesty. In fact, it is Jesus who labels the manager as dishonest. 
He calls him out as dishonest and operating within the constructs of culture that were about getting ahead no matter what the means. Jesus is not saying be dishonest. And we have to make that point because without paying attention to that detail, this remains the weirdest parable Jesus ever told. So Jesus is not saying be dishonest. It's not okay. Okay? Good? We, do we have that? Don't be dishonest. But here's what Jesus is saying. While Jesus is clear in his identification of the manager as dishonest, he is also clear in praising the shrewd behavior, the shrewd use of resources. And so I dug into this word shrewd a little bit. I one time heard a speaker say that shrewd is a word that as Christians we haven't really accepted as something that we can be. And we talk about shrewd and so often we hear this word shrewd, we think about the enemy, how the enemy is shrewd. Or we think about unethical things. We see that word as bad or negative. But if we do a Google thesaurus search, which is what I did, shrewd means wise and intelligent and prudent. And so now we've gotten clear that Jesus says the manager is dishonest, but he's also praising him for being wise. This is quickly becoming not the weirdest parable ever told. So what Jesus is doing is, use, is, is saying is use present opportunities in a wise manner for a future greater end. In our present age, we are called to pay mind to our greater end, which is our eternal future. I pulled into this a little bit more, and the word dishonest here is not talking about the means by which he made the, the decisions. The word dishonest here is referring to things of this world. Dishonest is one of those words that from Greek to English we kind of get lost in translation. Dishonest is from a word mammon that means um, of this world. Right here, right now. The present age. And throughout scripture you cannot go a page without realizing that the present age is an order that is perishing and has no permanent meaning. None at all. And so when we keep that in mind, what it means to operate in a present age that is perishing, again, it's not so weird, this parable. And so Jesus uses a series of contrasts, faithful, not faithful, little, much, wealth, true riches. There it is. To help us understand that the attitude towards our possessions and our money and the things of this time and place this perishing world is probably a good indication of our attitude toward the king and the kingdom to whom we belong. And so the question that kept coming to my mind as I was working on this passage and praying about this, it's written all over my Bible in my office. It is written all over sheets of paper. Andrea, which kingdom consumes you? Which Lord do you worship? Which kingdom consumes you? Which Lord do you worship? So let's go back to Luckenbach for a minute. The truth is, is it's so easy for us to be consumed by this age. Mm. And that's why these lyrics spoke to me this week. Specifically, we've been so busy keeping up with the Joneses. That song was written in 1977. A lot has changed in the almost 40 years. Specifically, how things are marketed to us. If they were talking about keeping up with the Joneses in 1977, you can bet that it still applies to us. Obviously, George Jones, there's all kinds of context there, and I understand that. But everywhere we look and listen, it is saturated with advertisement. The average person is exposed to thousands of advertising images each week. If you're bored and want to Google this right now, find out how many images our kids are, are exposed to each week. 
And so for us as Christians, we find ourselves in this tension. And sometimes this tension is excruciating between the right here and the right now and the not yet, which is the kingdom of God. As we think about this passage, there's three truths we have to address this morning. One, God is God. God is God. He alone is seated on the throne. He will allow no rivals. God is God. Number two, if we allow the things of this world to rule us, it can be pretty evident that God's lordship, truth number one, has not been accepted by us, at least not fully. And number three, when we examine our, ourselves, our hearts, and we think about the things that hold us or try to hold us, we can see how we have been swayed, we can repent, and then we can once again acknowledge that God is God alone. You see, when we consciously examine the things that, the, the way things hold us or try to hold us, we can recognize our weak spots. We can see what tempts us and what beckons us, what gets our interest in such a way that we don't respond wisely. And then when we repent of that, we can again accept God's lordship and get busy living into the kingdom of God. And so I, I think for Monday, as we leave here today and think about, well, what does this weirdest path of parable ever told? How does that apply tomorrow for Monday? What do we do with this reality? Our things, our money, our possession are things of this age. What's interesting is that no matter how big, how expensive, how extravagant, they are still little. He who has been faithful with little are so little when contrasted with the kingdom of God. And so let's get back to the basics of love. We are faithful with little when we detach our meaning and value from stuff. And when we instead cling to the identity in Christ. You see, Will Kavanaugh writes, there's a great book called Being Consumed. When we take the body and blood of Christ, instead of simply consuming it, we are consumed by it. Being consumed by Christ means that our meaning and our purpose and our value is found squarely and solely in who Christ says we are. And sometimes we need a reminder of who Christ says we are. We are not target groups, focus groups, demographics to sell stuff to. We are loved by the creator of the universe. We are accepted by him. We are precious in his sight. He says your value is in me. He says you are free. But we so quickly forget that. And so our first basic of love today is that this world has nothing for us. Christ is all we need. We are faithful with little when we use our present resources wisely as a means to a greater end. What is this greater end? The greater end is greater attachment to God and greater understanding and acceptance of who he says we are. The greater end is greater attachment and relationship with our brothers and sisters in Christ who are living in the same tension. And the greater end is bringing those truths about who Christ says we are to a world that does not know and has not heard. Faithfulness is determined by our ability to orient ourselves not in this kingdom, but in the one to come. And so for Monday, what defines you? How are you defined? Where do you need to be challenged? Where do you need to grow in being defined and identified by who you are in Christ? 
And maybe you're already there. Maybe you know that he alone is God. And if that's you, how are you being challenged to use what you have to grow in faith, love, and obedience to God? How are your resources, how can your resources help others become consumed by Christ? I know for me and Jeff, Jeff and I, this started with us with a gut feeling and a little prodding sensation that we were not paying full attention. And it convicted us and convicted us and convicted us. And that's maybe where you are today. What is that little meter that goes up? As I close today, I, I want to share with you that this passage and others like it come the cost. Whoever would follow after me must deny himself. Have deeply convicted Jeff and I over the years. We have been challenged over and over again and had to reset more than a few times. We have had to confess over and over again of clinging to stuff and serving this world and not the one to come. If this had not convicted this us four years ago, I wouldn't be here because I would still be living in my brand new house in Fargo. We have been convicted of our clinging to things of this world. I say the tension is excruciating because it is. The constant barrage and pressure to purchase, to buy more, get this, have that, meet this expectation. It's not even September or October yet, Halloween, and it's Christmas in the stores. Every time I go online, the ads are specific to what I have most recently liked or pinned or favorited. Pay attention to that if you never had. I want to admit that this is easy, but it's not, and so I'm not, I'm not going to say that. But I also need to be very clear that as we have detached meaning and value from stuff and have used our resources for God's glory, we have been changed from the inside out. Five years ago, we would have never taken a four-year-old to Jamaica. But we did. And we meet God where he's at. We serve him where he has called us to go. Our faith has grown exponentially. And when you detach your meaning from this world and live fully into the next, hold on, you're on, you're, you're signing up for a roller coaster ride. I'm so glad I'm here. And so I started with one song, but I'm going to conclude with a different one today, a different artist. This one is a Christian artist named Toby Mack. And the prayer that I have regularly prayed for myself and the one that I invite you to pray with me this morning is from his song, Lose My Soul. And so we are going to pray this together. Lord, forgive us when the things of this world fight and consume us for our love and our passion. As our eyes are open wide and fixed on you, God, grant us the privilege of your worldview. And would your kingdom be what wakes us up and what lays us down? Amen.
Apostles' Creed, as found on page 4. I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated for the offering.
Rejoicing in the Spirit's work among us, let us pray for the church, the world, and all those in need. I will end each petition with Lord in your mercy. Please respond, hear our prayer. Giver of the feast, bless your church and all who hunger and thirst. Nourish us richly with your word and meal, and send us signs as your living presence in the world. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Ruler of the earth, bring forth an abundant harvest from fields, orchards, and gardens. Renew fields that will soon lie fallow. Feed and protect all wild creatures. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. God of the nations, we pray for places in the world affected by conflict, war, and turmoil. We pray that your perfect peace and order be restored. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. God of our weary years, we remember before you those among us who are sick or who are recovering from illness or surgery. Marguerite Jensen and Eileen Weber. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. God, our beginning and ending, we thank you for hope even in the midst of despair. Visit this assembly with your light and truth. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. You are the source of eternal salvation. We remember before you the faithful witnesses who have gone before us, especially Joyce Schiffler, and now rest forever in your peace. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. We pray for Eric Grossler and Kristen Bloomquist, who were united in marriage on September 10th. Fill them with such love and joy that may, they may build a home of peace and welcome. Lord, in your mercy. God of our silent tears, we remember the faithful departed who make up the great cloud of witnesses. Gather us all in praise around your throne. Lord, in your mercy. Into your hands, O oh God, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting you in your mercy through our, your Son, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. God Almighty, send you light and truth to keep you all the days of your life. The hand of God protect you, the holy angels accompany you, and the blessing of the Almighty God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you forever. Amen. The closing hymn is hymn number 543.